Hey everybody, today we're going to be talking about finding the key to live with joy in a world that is less than ideal. We're starting a brand new message series in John chapter 16, and the topic we're talking about today is take heart. Now, have you ever noticed that we live in a world that is sometimes broken? In fact, this is a living sermon illustration I didn't plan, but as I showed up here at Garden Space to tape today's sermon, like I heard all of these sirens come by, and you can kind of see like right outside there are all kinds of ambulances and you'll even probably see those flashing lights during the talk today that wasn't planned but it's just such a reminder that this is a broken world there's a police car on either side of my vehicle i was like have i been found are they taking me to jail but i think someone is dealing with an issue outside that they're helping out which happens a lot downtown and i'm so grateful for those folks who are first responders yeah, we need reminders that we live in a broken world. I don't think so. We see those reminders every single day. What we really need is a framework to find hope, happiness, and joy in a world that is less than perfect. And if that's what you're looking for today, I believe the Word of God has answers for you. Let me read this passage of Scripture right off the bat. John 16, 33. These are the words of Jesus spoken the night before he gave his life to save humanity, rescuing us and offering us a hope of everlasting life. Here's what Jesus said. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I've overcome the world. Today we're going to be talking about what it means to take heart in a broken world. These are timeless principles and one of my very favorite passages. But first of all, let's talk about one of the greatest obstacles of your happiness. Um, a lot of us think that uh, we have a lack of happiness because of the circumstances in our life, which is partially true. But any marriage counselor or a person who works with folks on finding joy, they'll tell you one of the greatest killers of happiness are our expectations. We all have these great expectations, these desires for a better life and a better world, but nothing is more disappointing than when your expectations aren't met. A couple of years ago, I was on a cross country road trip where I was pulling like 12, 14 hour days driving across the country and I was doing it all by myself. And you might think that's crazy, but it was actually a lot of fun. But boy, can I tell you, by the end of the day, I was ready for that soft bed in a hotel room. So one night, I, you know, earlier in the day, I had booked a hotel at my next destination on Orbitz. I looked at the hotel. It was a decent brand. It was a chain of hotels that I'd stayed at before. And so I had expectations of a great night's sleep. So I get there, I pull up in the parking lot. It's late at night. Uh, there's snow on the ground outside. The air smells fresh and clean and cold. And man, I'm so ready for that warm, cozy room. And I walk into the lobby and it was the lobby of nightmares. <laughs> First of all, the floor was really sticky, gross. I walk in, the people there working the front desk look like they were surprised to see me. I look over and this old guy is sitting on like the 1995 hotel computer looking at some really bad stuff for everyone to see. And then when he could tell I noticed him, he just kind of chuckled this weird chuckle and kept looking. I thought, okay, maybe I could just sleep in my car, but now I'm afraid of what's lurking in the parking lot. So finally I get my hotel room key and I'm like rushing into my room. I open the door and all the walls are painted red. I'm like, who paints a hotel room red? This is weird. And I take one big deep breath and found out I got a smoking room, not a non-smoking room. So at this point, I'm like, do I go back to the creepy lobby with the creepy people and try to get my room changed? Or do I just make this work? And so I decided not even to get my suitcase out of the car because I didn't want all my stuff to smell like smoke. Red wall smells like smoke. I was like, this is the closest to hell I ever want to be. I slept a couple of hours, got up early the next day and left. So not only was it a crappy room, what made it so bad is that I had expectations of a warm, cozy night's sleep. A lot of us experience disappointments in life because of the expectations we have. I think it's okay to have expectations, but I was reading a little bit this week on the psychology of our expectations. The Bible and science link up constantly on what it means to navigate the human experience. I was reading a study from Professor Wolfram Schultz at Cambridge University. And he said the dopamine cells sit deep within the brain. And of course, we all remember that dopamine is the neurotransmitter of de desire. 
It's the, re it's the reward response in our brains. And a lot of dopamine can actually mimic a drug high. So if you're feeling a, just a surge of joy and happiness, um, it has a lot to do with the dopamine being released in your brain. When a cue from your environment indicates you're going to be getting a reward, dopamine releases in response. So chemically, if you think, man, Disney World is going to be awesome, Christmas is going to be great, the reason you're feeling good is because in that moment of expectation, dopamine is being released. And unexpected rewards release more dopamine. So that's why people love surprises. I hate surprises. Probably my therapist needs to help me that realize I have issues of control. <laughs> So I hate surprises. Um, oh, look, the ambulance is gone. Nope, you still see it there. Okay. Um, so anyway, let's keep going. Uh, if you get a great surprise, a flood of dopamine can hit your brain. So that's why people like surprises. However, if you have great expectations that are not met, uh, it actually withholds dopamine, sort of like a drug. And the feeling of disappointment is not a pleasant one. It feels a lot like pain from a scientific perspective. If you're expecting for 2021 to be the relief year from 2020, you probably experienced some pain. If you experienced a relationship in your life to solve all your problems, probably what happened is that human being that you're in a relationship with turned out to be human and they let you down. And the breaking of that expectation in your life, it creates a very painful feeling. Happy people, on the other hand, a huge key to happiness is learning how to embrace reality and to set our expectations accordingly. There's a difference between realism and cynicism. And I think that Jesus gives us the opportunity in the passage that, he, that I just shared to embrace the reality of this life with a sense of hopeful expectation rooted in his character. Jesus is kind. He sets our expectations for life in this world according to him so that our joy may be full and that we won't fall away. Let me read the passage again and then we'll point out a few things we can learn from this. John 16, Jesus says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. This passage holds so many answers to so many questions in this life. The question for us is, are we willing to listen? The next question is this, are you ready for trouble? Because the truth is, trouble is unavoidable. There's a first thing I wanna show you in this passage, here it is. God wants you to experience peace in a challenging world. Look again, he said, I've said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. I think we in our world today make a tragic miscalculation when we mistake the world's chaos for God's character. I'm gonna say that again. So often we make a miscalculation when we equate the world's chaos with God's character. And in this passage, we see the two aren't the same. I hear people ask all the time, why would a good God let something bad like this happen to me? They're saying that because in that moment, they're equating the world's chaos with God's character. And it's not the same. Because in this moment, we see both the chaos of the world and the character of God. We hear the character of God in the person of Jesus saying, in this world, we have unavoidable chaos, but his desire for us is peace. If you wanna know the life that God wants for you, it's a life of shalom. That's what the word in this passage, peace, means. Don't confuse the world's chaos with God's character. God desires for you to have fullness, joy, and love. So then we have to unpack and understand where does all this bad stuff come from? In order to do that, we have to look back at God's original plan for humanity. We see in the Garden of Eden, God's perfect plan was perfect love, perfect connection, and perfect freedom. And freedom, that's a funny word, isn't it? I just watched the new episode of Winter Soldier and Falcon. I don't I think I switched it. I mean, I love it. And you have these people in the episode that call themselves freedom fighters. And that's a really odd term, freedom fighter. It reminds us that freedom is beautiful, but it's also 
messy. Freedom is beautiful, but it's messy. And that really sums up the story of humanity, is that God in his perfect love gave us this real freedom. And that human beings, in our miscalculations, and our mistakes, and our short fallings, we use that freedom sometimes to do wonderful things. And we use that freedom sometimes to do terrible things. The Bible teaches that God is the source of all life. And sin means separation, a disconnection, not just from the teachings of God, but from the life force. I think back to the original lie in the Garden of Eden where the serpent told Eve, hey, eat this fruit and you can be like God. Well, there was the original lie because in so many ways, Adam and Eve were already like God. So the real lie was this, eat this and you can be like God without God. And Adam and Eve got their wish, but in doing so, they disconnected themselves and the rest of humanity from the life source of God. Sure, he's nearby, but that connection has been severed. And that's where all of our problems come from. When we disconnect from God in any way, decay begins immediately. And we start to see certain realities that nothing in this broken world will last forever, except for the love of God. I don't think you realize today how much God loves you. I think that even if you woke up this morning and you read 10 Bible verses about the love of God and you breathed in a big breath of air and it was fresh and you ate a nice warm toasty bagel that just made you feel all good and you drank a magical latte at the perfect temperature and you're feeling good today and you're feeling really aware of God's love, even if you're there, you are still not fully aware of God's love for you. In fact, the Bible says it needs supernatural help to have God open your eyes to how much he really loves you. And that's my prayer for you today, that you could understand the great width and depth and height and length of God's love for you. I don't think we realize today how much God is seeking our good. I uh, just had a really fun weekend because we got to celebrate my daughter Valentine's seventh birthday. I can't believe this wild life force of a creature has turned seven years old. And so she's super into Legos right now and I bought her this Lego set that she's been excited for. I didn't buy it. Gotta be honest here in church. Uh, my relatives bought it for her. I just get to benefit from their generosity. And uh, I don't know the last time you've done Legos, but I'm getting better every day. <laughs> uh, Legos have a design and they came with this little Lego bus, the set that she really wanted. And she worked on it by herself for a while and brought it back to me. And she's like, Dad, I'm so frustrated, it has problems. So I start looking at the bus and I see it looks okay, but in a lot of ways, it's falling apart. And so I started looking at why, and it turns out it's because along the way, my very creative out-of-the-box daughter just put the instructions away and she started doing things on her own. And for a while, it was going well, but when the pressure came, the design didn't hold up, it was falling apart. And so to make the bus right, we had to take everything apart and put it back together by design. I want you to know that God's design for this world was never chaos, but our freedom and our willfulness and our choices led to a world that's filled with exponential amounts of brokenness, where broken people do broken things to other broken people. That's the reality of the world, but it's not the design and desire of God. And in fact, we see in God's plan that he is going to set things right, but not by putting scotch tape on the problems. No, God came to do exactly what I had to do with the Legos with my daughter. He wants to take it all apart and put it back together again. That's why the, the plan and promise of God is not to offer you solutions. The plan and the promise of God is to offer you salvation. Jesus didn't say, I came so that you could become a little bit better. He said, I came that you could be born again. God wants to grant you peace in a challenging world. That doesn't mean that your pain isn't painful. It doesn't mean that religious sayings can put a rubber stamp on what you're dealing with. It does mean that the God of heaven wants you to know that through him, through his salvation work, through his power, peace is a possibility for you. There's a second thing that we see in this, that in the face of trouble, we can take heart. 
In fact, that's the only command or instruction that's given in this passage. We hear a lot about God. Jesus says, I tell you these things that in me you may have peace. Later, he's going to tell us that he has overcome the world. And next week, we're going to talk about that phrase. Oh, I'm so excited. But right there in the middle of this passage, we have instructions because God seeks to empower his people. He's empowering us with our next step. And in the face of trouble, you're not supposed to get over it. You're also not supposed to fix it. In the face of trouble, here's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to take heart. That's your invitation. Let's talk about that phrase, you will face trouble. If you expect this life to be free of trouble, you will be miserable. That goes back to our idea of expectations. If you think that devotion to God will spare you trouble in the short term, you will also be very disappointed. That's where we come up with this phrase. Why does God let bad things happen to good people? Well, there's a lot of issues with that statement, but one of them is this, is that Jesus was the best person and bad things happened to him. And it wasn't because of his sin, it was because of our sin. No, why do bad things happen to good people? Well, the worst thing happened to the best person. The Bible says, when he who knew no sin became sin so that we could know and become the righteousness of God. See there on the cross, Jesus stretched out his arms and he bore the full weight, the full weight of God's punishment for all the trouble that humanity has caused. And when Jesus died, the payment of sin was satisfied. And that is why Jesus is our hope and our salvation. So if the worst thing could happen to the best person, then bad things can happen to good people because we live in a world full of trouble. The word trouble in the Greek, it has two different kinds of meanings. The first is this, it means pressing together and pressure. There's a kind of trouble that you will face that's good for you, like an athlete faces pressure to do better, stress that pushes them stronger. Um, When you're working out, you're literally lifting weights, the weights are tearing apart your muscles, and when you get um, protein and rest, it bulks your muscles back up. As you can see, I'm an expert at that, just kidding. Um, There's a second kind of trouble, and it's in the Greek, it means agony. And this is not the kind of pain that makes you stronger. You shouldn't just press into agony. This is the kind of pain that you need to withdraw and recover from. And many of us have faced both kinds of trouble. We faced the pressure that can, you know, those people who say, what doesn't kill you make you stronger. That's the kind of pressure and trouble it's talking about. The second kind, agony, man, that is not something that we should press into. It's something we should get relief from. The truth of the matter is, is most of our life is spent trying to avoid pain that will ultimately be inevitable. Religion kind of says this, I'm going to take control of my approach to God. And yet we see time and again that that has its shortcomings. The reason people look for money is because they want to take control over their security. The reason people chase after politics is because they want to take control of power. People try to take control through materialism because they want to take control of their environment. And then people chase after sex because they want to take control over their pleasure. See, most of our life, really and truly, and most of our problems, really and truly, they come from trying to avoid pain in a world that is still broken. The truth is we're all bound for heartbreak as long as we are always trying to take control We live in a world that says the solution to your pain is to take control, yet we serve a God who says the solution to your pain is to take heart. And you have a choice today. Are you gonna keep trying to take control or are you willing to seek God in order to take heart? Taking heart means that you shift the way you look at trouble. That's not religious talk, it's just founded in the promises of God. That's the hope of the gospel and that's the strength God offers his people. I'm gonna tell you I had a rough couple of days a week back, and it just is from so many of the things that we've all been dealing with. The pandemic is changing everything in our world. We're finding new ways that it has disrupted our lives and making things harder. And sometimes it gets hard and sometimes it makes me weary. And you ever had the right song come on in the right moment? I had started a Spotify playlist based on this one song that I love called The Voice of God. Oh my gosh, such a good song. I listen to it all the time. I'll choke up every time. And I started a radio station based on that song, and a new song came up by Jonathan McReynolds. And here's some of the lyrics. 
He writes, may your struggles keep you near the cross and may your troubles show that you need God and may your battles end the way they should and may your bad days prove that God is good and may your whole life prove that God is good. I want you to listen to what Jesus said to his closest friends the night before he would be tortured to death to save mankind. He said this, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I've overcome the world. So good. I want you to know that's God's desire for you. You live in a world that confuses the world's chaos with God's character. Don't get them confused. In this simple sentence, we see the hope of God for your life, the power of God to achieve those results, and the love of God to bring you close to Him. He wants to give you peace, but not as this arbitrary gift. No, peace is a place of intimacy with God. He says, in me, you will have peace. See, we deep down want to take control. Jesus invites us to take heart. And so how do we apply a message like this? This week, I encourage you, acknowledge what is broken. Don't deny it. Don't run from it. Don't obsess over it. Just acknowledge what's broken. And maybe you need to make a list. God, my heart is broken over this, 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 and this. And take a real honest look about how you have been wounded by a broken world. The second thing is, is to make some space to grieve. Grieving is a holy moment. There's a difference between grieving and dwelling. Grieving your pain means that you're opening up your heart and your emotions in a very real way, in a hopeful way to a God who can heal. And dwelling means that you become identified with your past hurts and troubles. So acknowledge what's broken and make some time to grieve and then make some space to rejoice Rejoice in the fact that you're alive. Rejoice in the fact that Christ is alive. Rejoice in the fact that God gave another day and in this day, he loves you. Find other reasons to rejoice. Name your blessings. Both the Bible and scripture says this is a way to experience uplift and make some space in your life to acknowledge Jesus to look to the one who came for you, to look to the one who's never stopped loving you. He's never stopped wanting you. And that is the great hope of the gospel, is not to fix your behavior to somehow make God happy. The hope of the gospel is to come to Jesus so that he can make you whole and that he can make you his. He wants you, he loves you, he came for you, he lived for you. And maybe the last question should be, what should our expectations be? If our expectations are that we serve God for a trouble-free life, then you're going to be disappointed. But if your expectations are that God can rework your mind, He can rework your heart, so that troubles impact you in a different way, then you're going to experience the beginnings of everlasting life in the here and the now. You're going to see the kingdom come. You're going to see it breaking through the clouds. You're going to see a hope like you've never seen. And other people are going to see the joy in your face and wonder what kind of God must be near. I just want you to know I'm praying for you. I love you. And I hope that you find it in your life and heart to take heart. Mm -hmm.